So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today I have Joshua March, CEO and co-founder of Converse Social. Hi Josh. Hi Adrian. So is it Josh or Joshua? Would you prefer? Uh, usually Josh when we're talking. Fine, brilliant Josh, thank you. Let me, well, I always start the interviews with a question which says, so Josh, tell us a bit about you and about the work that you do and what you do sort of specifically within the business, just as a bit of a, a, an introduction. Sure. So I've been working in social now since 2007 mm-hmm. uh, um, when the Facebook platform launched. and I thought it was a, an exciting opportunity for, for brands to engage with their customers in a new way. Um, I helped to set up an event called the Facebook Developer Garage, which was an official Facebook event sponsored by Facebook for people working in the industry, which I ran for for two years. We had about 200 people coming every month. Uh And at the beginning of 2008, I set up a company called iPlatform, which uh, became one of the first ever preferred developers of Facebook in the world. Uh, We're building kind of Facebook apps for big brands and competitions, promotions, that kind of thing. But I, I was really, I had this really core belief that uh, communication was shifting into social and that, that, that was going to fundamentally change how you know, companies communicated with their customers. Okay. And so we decided to, in t- 2009, we, we decided to start building software to help companies manage that communication, which, uh, which is what became Converse Social. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, in Converse Social itself, I'm you know, the CEO. I'm very involved in, in the product direction and the kind of general strategy of the company as well as being the kind of face of it. Okay. Uh, and I try and spend a lot of time kind of in our customers' call centers and understanding our kind of major customers' needs uh, and how that's going to change in future. So you are spending a lot of time at the call face? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. There's, no, there's, there's nothing better than a bit of immersion. Definitely not. So it leads me to the, the next point, which is so customer service and social mm. customer service in yeah. particular seems to be really high on the agenda. Why, is, do you, why do you think that is? I mean, what's changing around us to drive that? Yeah, so, I mean, let me go back in time a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, when you know, we started Converse Social, we didn't have a focus on customer service at the very beginning. We just wanted to, we were focusing on helping companies communicate with their customers mm-hmm. over social. But we quite quickly started to see, and this was kind of end of 2010, early 2011, that um, people, you know, customers, were starting to use company Facebook pages and Twitter accounts as a, as a direct customer service channel. Right. Um, and not just the kind of, Tweeting how much you hate Tesco um, or, or Walmart, or, you know, Walmart or you know whatever, but actually going direct you know, at Tesco or yeah, you know, sure at, at Waitrose or whatever, and, and with real genuine questions, genuine complaints, the kind of thing that people would have emailed or, or phoned about before. Um, we started to see that this was this was happening and that it was it was increasing, uh, and we were lucky enough to start working with a few very early innovative companies who you know, who'd realised that the only the way they could actually deal with this effectively would be to have real customer service agents trained in social who were able to respond direct. Right. And we, we saw that that was really the, the only, you know, that was the only model that could work long term. Almost everyone else we, we saw and we spoke to was still trying, was still viewing social really as a, as a marketing activity. And they had social media managers or community managers kind of doing their best to kind of keep customers happy, but you know, who weren't able to actually resolve real customer service issues. And we just thought, as this keeps getting bigger and bigger, there's, there's no way that social can't move into the call center. It has to do that. Yes. You, you, you need real customer service agents. And, and so we really started, you know, that, and it was at that time that we decided to focus 100% on, on social customer service. And, but at the time, you know, we, we really tried, we, 2011 was a struggle. To, we were trying to tell companies, we are doing lots of research, lots of thought leadership, and we were going out there and telling companies, you, know, you need real customer service agents doing social. Uh, and, and the vast majority of companies just just you know, didn't didn't accept that viewpoint. They really viewed social as a pure marketing channel. It was only a few very early innovators. But I think that there's now, if you go back into kind of mid 2011, we we did a, this research report uh, called "Who's Ignoring Their Customers." Yeah, we're, we're looking at yeah, looking at the uh, which companies were doing social customer service and which ones were just ignoring their customers or you know, who was actually resolving complaints. And at the time, we got massive amounts of PR for it. And it was like kind of like this new thing, like oh my god, this you know, social customer service. Fast forward, um, you know, into 2012, and there is now every single week probably multiple reports coming out and research being done on you know, who's good at this, who's 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 performing, who's you know, how fast are people responding, what do people expect, uh, which companies are good, which companies are bad, 
you know, from from all over. Uh, it's really this kind of meme of social customer service, and that you and it's an important thing that you have to do has just kind of built up and built up for, from nothing a year ago. Mm-hmm. So, so now it's kind of you know, constantly being talked about, and, and certainly we've seen you know, from from the customer point of view, you know, we view 2011 really as it was only a, a few very early innovators who were setting up real social customer service teams. Now we, we think the market's moved into the kind of early adopter phase, right? Uh, and almost every company, almost every company we speak to, is either in the process of setting up a social customer service team, yes, or even if they're not, they they, they now accept that they do. Yeah, you know, they accept that they have to. We, you know, there's almost no company we speak to who who don't realise that this is something that they do have to do now. So I mean, I've seen a lot of res- I mean research like your like your own, but also from other people where they, you know there's it, the research has said up to about 70% of some uh, in, of brands in some sectors are just not responding to questions or resp- you know complaints or or queries that are posted on on social sites and is that because the the shift is just happening and we're just moving into the um the, the social customer service phase is and, and it's growing in maturity yeah, i mean like i said we think it's gone from innovators to early adopters it's, yeah. it's not, not mainstream yet no not at all and so what, what are the things that are, I guess, what are the barriers to companies adopting that or, or changing their mindset? Is it because that we're too, uh, many corporations are too silo-focused? So, I mean, there's a number of things in there, but, and it does really require, you know, it requires serious executive buy-in mm-hmm. uh, properly and multiple departments working together. If you imagine that you know, it, it took marketing a few years to kind of build up their own social teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Back to 2007, 2008, 2009, when I was first building Facebook apps, it was very much just an external agency activity. Yes. Um, and you know, by 2011, you know, it moved on to the, to the state where marketing, internal marketing departments had their own social teams. It took them a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they kind of built them up and they have their budgets. To actually get a, a brand new team with new resources, with new training in completely different departments, who you know, otherwise have no incentive to, to get involved in social? Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it does require serious executive buy-in. You, know, you need to. You need. It requires serious budget to set up a team, even if just ten people. Sure. You know, a lot of salaries. Marketing needs to be confident that uh, the social team can represent the brand mm-hmm. publicly. Social accounts on these channels that they own. So that requires a lot of cross-departmental processes. Uh, it requires a lot of new training. Yeah, so so it is a serious thing to set up a proper social customer service team. Yes. Uh, yeah, I and mean, every company has to do it because the alternative is, like I said, just ignoring their customers very publicly. But uh, but it's not it's not something that you know, can just be switched on overnight. And so is that something? I mean, are are you in danger of becoming not just a software company, but also a software and services company? Um, so our, our approach is generally to do the best practice for free. Right. Okay. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, is that a missed opportunity, perhaps? There's different levels of sure. this. Um, yeah, and that, yeah, we do a lot of what we we do this best practice guide. We blog a lot. We try and uh, yeah, educate our customers as the best way of doing it. You, you increasingly, we recently set up an implementation team to to help our large customers and our large contract to really understand the best practices on on how to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we have sometimes partnered with agencies who are providing more services around it. Right. Okay. And in the one of the the previous interviews that I did, I was speaking to uh, Frank Eliasson, who yeah. many call him the, the what the father of social customer service. I guess given that he, what he did at, at Comcast Cares a number of years ago, um, and he he came out with a bold statement where he he said that actually. Many companies don't need social customer service; they just need to fix the core. So I think that um, I'm a massive fan of Frank. I mean, he's, he's kind of yeah you know, done massive amounts for the industry. Um, he's been a very vocal proponent from the very very early days. Um, but I think that you know, when he set up Comcast Cares, mm-hmm. uh, the real you know, 99 percent of probably all of the issues they're dealing with were people. Not really tweeting direct to at Comcast Cares help me. Right. Tweeting, oh my god, I've had such a terrible experience with Comcast, uh, or complaining about it, and they they were proactively reaching out and fixing it. And and that yeah, in the in the first few years of social customer service, that was ninety nine percent 
of, of it. And, and for that kind of customer service, he is absolutely right that you know, it shouldn't get to that stage. Yes. It, it shouldn't get to the stage where customers are so frustrated that they have to turn to social to try and get help. Um, right. So are you saying that there's there's actually two phases in it? There is... Um, there are phases, because the other, other reason that we've seen that, that's actually increased more recently is that people are just using social as their preferred communication channel. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're on Facebook all the time, you know, if, you're, if you're a 16, 17-year-old, and Facebook is, you, you don't really use email anymore. Right. You, you use Facebook to message all your friends. Companies have spent hundreds of millions training you to engage with them on there. And you know, you've got you've just ordered something online, uh, you know, from I don't know Sephora, for example, for one of our customers in the US. Uh -huh. and, yeah, and it hasn't arrived yet. And they, you know, and you, you're on Facebook, and there's a big message button on their Facebook page where you can send them a full length, complete issue, everything you've got. Or you know, what do you do? Do you do that, or, or do you actually go to the website and try and look up a support email address? Right. And they're just going to send a Facebook message. So there's a difference between, in, for, in some companies' cases, or there's diff I get different phases and different cycles of maturity. In, in some cases that some people are using it, depending, I guess, on their, their own sort of pre preferences and behaviors, that some people are using it as a last resort, and that's a bit more of a reactive thing. But, some, but m the more mature adopters are actually saying this is a full-blown, um, fully equipped, fully manned service channel, and that's because it's aligned with their customers' preferences. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And I think that you've got to recognise your customers' preferences. Yeah. So where, where people are just complaining and, and, and frustration, definitely you should really try and look what the underlying cause is and, and, and try and fix that to prevent it. But where people are just using it as their preferred communication channel, you know, you, you have to deal with it properly. You, you can't put yourself out there on Twitter or Facebook. And then not be willing to you know, respond to customers who are trying to communicate with you over it. Yeah, and I think that's the, the that's the, the the challenge where socials actually it's grown up in the marketing department, which is which has traditionally been a uh, a broadcast medium, as it were, or, or has a, had a broadcast remit where um, they push things out to try and uh, if you like catch the attention or attract the attention of of their customers. But when the customers actually respond, they're not necessarily equipped to deal with with that. And that, yeah. and therefore, that's why I guess is that why I guess you're saying that you're saying that social sh should actually sit, at least social service should actually be shifted over into customer service, and it should be in the not necessarily the call center, but it should be in the customer service function because they are the people that are more and better equipped to deal with those the, those queries. Absolutely, I mean for two reasons. First of all, they can actually resolve real issues. Mm -hmm. Best, they, they've got the, the software, they've got the knowledge, they've got the connections to, to actually fix real issues, issue refunds, buy network stock, the kind of things you know, that people, if they've got a problem, they want an answer. Mm -hmm. They're not told to go somewhere else. Um, and, and so first of all, they're better equipped to do that. But second of all, they're far better equipped to deal with scale. Sure. So you often hear marketing people in social say, oh, there's no way we can, you know, we'd be able to cope with the, the scale of the comments that come through Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I always laugh a little bit inside when I hear that because the, the people who say that obviously have no idea how many phone calls and emails their organization receive every month. Yes. Yeah, the amount of, you know, we, the amount of tweets and I mean, we, we've got, we, we have customers who have some of the largest social customer service teams in the world. Yeah, we're talking 40, 50, 60 agents full time just doing social. Right. Yeah, which is massive. Absolutely. But the amount of Facebook comments and tweets, and, and by the way, almost all those people, it's up you know, two, three, four, even five times the size of a year ago. But even for all of those people, the numbers that they're getting are nowhere near the amount of emails and phone calls they get. You know, for those same companies who maybe have 40, 50 social agents, they might have 2,000 plus you know, agents dealing with emails and phone calls. Sure. And so you know, custom service teams can deal with massive amounts of scale if they have the right tools and processes in place. And so there, there really isn't a scale issue with social at the moment yet. So you say that there's, there's, there are companies that are they're, they're building up their teams in the, in the social service area. They're, they're, those teams are still dwarfed by the standard sort of email and phone call response teams. Do you see the social teams actually scaling up even more to almost catch up and become on a par with the phone and email sort of call center approaches? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, we have... 
we have one major retail customer who, you know, a year ago they had four custom service agents full time. Now they've got forty. Uh, they have four hundred doing email, and you know, we think that within a couple of years they could easily have four hundred doing social. Wow. Okay. And is that is that more just to do with changing preferences, or is it to do with you know uh, different age groups, or is it just or is it a combination of both? You know? I think I think it's a combination of many things. I think that there's you know, growing awareness among customers that mm-hmm. social is an effective customer service channel, mm-hmm. and the fact that it's public often means that they you know, get a faster and, and better service. Mm-hmm. You know, especially because companies you know, realise that. What goes online is so. You know, what goes publicly is a response from your brand. Yes, it's so, and they're often putting their best, most highly qualified, highly trained, highly able agents onto social. Mm-hmm. Often people are getting a better customer service experience over social than they can over other channels. Um, and so they're realizing that because it's public, other customers are realizing that. You know, company. You know, people are going onto company Facebook pages or seeing they're on Twitter and seeing they're doing this great service over social, and so. That kind of builds up and builds up as more people realize and more people realize. Um, social is just becoming more and more of a preferred channel of communication in general. And companies in, yeah, continue to spend hundreds of millions uh, training customers to engage with them um, over, over social. Uh, so, and also, yeah, there's younger people who are, yeah, use social as their preferred channel already as they grow up and become customers. Yeah, all, all of these things all combine together. Fantastic. I mean, so... But that feels like, I mean, so you've got a lot of people that are, you know, customers that are driving this, you know, this change, but that's probably going to feel quite foreign to, to most C-level or board-level executives. So, I mean, and is that, do we have to, you know, if we want to precipitate change in, in organizations, is that where we have to, we have, do we have to change their minds? Do we have to? Are we, you know, do we have to actually try and convince the CEOs or kind of be start at different levels to... At more of a guerrilla activity, you know, if you want to get companies to shift into this area, I, mean, I, I think the quickest way is definitely to get that executive level support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly what we've seen in our company, in our customers, is that the ones who've really done social service in the best way and really had multiple departments working together effectively, um, it's always been when there's been yeah some kind of C level interest in this and, and you know at a sea level they've kind of gone down and said we need to be you know, doing social right um you know it can't we can't just be publishing out stuff we need our own people we need to be analyzing the data we need real customer service agents we need pr and communications and, and marketing and, and customer service all working together and, and you know when that happens and the magic yeah, magic happens as it were yeah uh, sure because it's very hard for people within those departments to you know they can they can affect change within their department very hard for someone in marketing or a social media manager to you know, really set up new customer service teams, you know, which are run on a separate budget and a separate physical location. Um, so you know, it, it, it can happen, but it's it's much harder. And what what we sometimes see is that marketing will kind of persuade customer service to, to give them a couple of customer service agents kind of on loan, right? Help them out, um, which can be a kind of way in. But but in general, we're kind of yeah. It really happens when you have executive level buy-in at some at some at some time. Okay, I mean, so there's two things that that, that, that remind me. Of, I've just remembered what I was going to say from earlier is that. So there's many companies that are talking about becoming more customer centric, improving their overall experience, um, become more customer focused. If we may, if if executives made this sort of change and went, well, actually, we need to adopt social service and we need to invest in it and build up our teams and 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 and, and grow it. Do you think that could be a, a, a case of actually it could be the tail wagging the dog and that could lead them closer to becoming more customer focused as a, as an initiative? Um, I, I mean, I certainly think that you know, social in general forces companies to become more customer centric. Uh-huh. It's so public, it, you know, it, it's so visible. Yeah, you know, I think that a lot of this, you know, a CEO can log onto their Facebook page and see customer service happening. Sure. From, Real time in public, you know, and customer feedback, and we're seeing, you know, increasingly at a C level, they are you know, social is becoming so important that they're kind of going. They're asking for weekly reports to executives on what's happening in social. Yeah, uh, which is including all this, you know, amazingly valuable data about what customers are saying 
uh, and the stories that customers are sharing and the sentiment of those in, in a way that you know, the kind of data they probably just didn't have before or, or probably was being collected in their call center but just wasn't, you know, wasn't interesting enough to them to, to get weekly reports on you know, what, what the customers are saying in phone calls. Um, that social is kind of so high up the agenda for some companies that, that it is generating that kind of interest. And I think that that's powerful and that has the ability to, to change the, the way that, that companies are, pro- are thinking about their customers. But the second thing I was going to say was that given all of the services so public and customers can see this and respond to it, marketing could feel probably quite threatened by that. And Thomas, to quote an old industry sort of headline that floats around is that is customer service the new marketing well yeah i mean it's interesting right when your customer service response becomes the public face of the brand but yes. you know, it's something that marketing need not only to be bought into but need to be a big part of and this is a big change for customer service as well you know almost every every social customer service team we work with has a workflow and a process mm-hmm. which yeah, basically says, yeah, this is the kind of thing you can respond to. This is the kind of thing you need approval from your team leader. And this is the kind of thing that you need to go and speak to Martin about. Right. Things about before you can respond. Or even just hand over for them to respond. And then, you yeah, when a new agent comes on, you yeah, the training and the tone of voice training, etc., that they're given is often given by marketing or, or written by marketing. Yeah, because they're in charge of the, <clears throat> many times they're in charge of the brand and therefore understanding the values and everything else and what the, the do's and the don'ts, I guess. But it's not that marketing disappears. No. Marketing has a very important role, but it is that there's much more, you know, marketing is starting to get involved with how customer service operates and customer service are getting involved with how marketing operates. So it's almost like that rather than both just having external functions, they're also having internal, sort of almost internal consultancy functions as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. So Joshua, just in the, uh, in, in the interest of time, um, now, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. We, we are living through interesting times, and I think there's going to be a huge amount of change coming up in the next two to three years. I mean, if you were to say to, to one executive or one CEO or leader in a business that's, that's listening to this or reading the, uh, the notes, and they were saying, that's brilliant. Now, where do I start? What would you say to them? Uh, I'd say go and download our best practice guide. I knew you were going to say that, so that's why I made a note. <laughs> Which is uh, you obviously you download it from the website from social dot com, completely free, and yeah, we've just tried to pull together the best practice um, that we've seen, not just across our own customers, but also across you know, what sort of companies we speak to. So it's not at all particular to us. It's just you know it, it, it outlines the best practice we've seen to set up a social customer service team and process. That's fantastic. Uh, well, I'll make sure I link all that up and and direct people to that. And that's I mean I downloaded it and that's how I got in touch with with yourselves. Because Rachel followed up with me, and then I badgered her for an interview. <laughs> Great. Well, yeah, and yeah, that's something, and that's a work in progress as well. Yeah, that this is addition one, and we have we'll be updating it constantly. Fantastic. That's really good. And two final things before we, before we wrap up is you're almost at the you know at the front edge of the of this industry, and uh, yourself and and a couple of other uh, players. But this stuff's happening so fast. I mean, how do you how do you keep up? I mean. You know, there's so much information out there. I mean, do you read anything specifically? Do you not read anything in order to keep up? I mean, what do you do to stay ahead? I think the most important thing to stay ahead is to go and spend time with our customers. Right. There's nothing I can read that's, that you know, we're working with you know, many of the leading companies in this space. Yeah. Um, and so really understanding what they're doing and what they're thinking is, is the most important way. Now, obviously saying that, you know, we, we speak regularly to all of the analysts, yep. all of the analyst firms. You know, I follow a lot of people on, on, on Twitter who I think are interesting and relevant in the industry and, and in startups and business in general. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I try and read as much as I can and books you know, on the market and, and on what's happening. Um, you know, not, just, not just looking ahead, but also you know, looking back to how other industries have, have evolved, a new, a new market, a new industry developing. And trying to understand, yeah, understand that as much as possible. Fantastic. And so that brings me to my final question, and that is, um, and I always f- finish the podcast on on this. And this question is: Is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? <laughs> uh, well, I think the shameless plug would be the best practice guide. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. 
Josh, thank you so much for your time today. It's been br uh, brilliant and enlightening and, and really great to get your perspective. So um, I'll let you know when it all is all live and get it all linked up as well. And uh, But thank you again. Right, no problem. Thanks, Adrian.